Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's show. Now, whooping cough or pertussis was one of the most common childhood diseases and a major cause of childhood mortality in the U.S. during the last century. Before the availability of pertussis vaccine in the 40s, more than 200,000 cases of pertussis were reported annually. Now, since the widespread use of the vaccine, incidence has decreased by like 75% uh, as compared to the pre-vaccine era. However, infections have begun to rise again, uh, mostly in the 90s toward the late 90s. So what is pertussis and why are the rates on the rise again? Well, joining me to discuss pertussis is Chandana Bala. Chandana is the president of Global Insight Advisory Network and writes on the intersection of healthcare and technology. And she is a frequent writer for Gideon Informatics. Hi, Chandana, and welcome to the program. Hi, Robert. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm, I'm more than pleased. Thank you very much. Um, let's start out with a little bit of background, just a summary of what is pertussis or what many people know it as, whooping cough. Sure. So pertussis is a severe bacterial infection. And like you said, it's better known as whooping cough. Another name for it is the 100-day cough. Um, it is, it, it's caused by the bacteria Bordetella pertussis. And like you mentioned, the mortality rate before the vaccine used to be extremely high. It was one in 10 deaths for case, cases that were found. Okay, good. You, 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 I'm sorry, you froze for a second. Um, Chandy, can you give some history on the pathogen here in the U.S. and globally? Sure. So, you know, uh, whooping cough has been around since the Middle Ages, and hundreds of thousands of people used to be affected every year. Um, but in the 1940s, a vaccine was developed and numbers drastically dropped. Um, for the U.S., for example, uh, the peak whooping cough cases were in the mid 50s, about 60, 63,000 cases. And by the 1970s and 1980s, we only had like a thousand cases a year or 2000 cases a year. That's how successful the vaccination drives were. Um, the funny thing is uh, towards the late 80s and the 90s, cases started to rise again. And uh, it, it hit a peak in 2012. There was an out. There was an outbreak in 2012, and it reached almost 49,000 cases. With then with further vaccination drives and awareness building, we have now brought it down again, where we average about 18,000 to 20,000 a year, and that that's in the U.S. And worldwide, according to the World Health Organization, there are 151,000 to 161,000 cases a year and mostly in developing countries. And they do stress that a lot of them are unreported or misreported. So you might actually have more cases. Sure. Um, now, pertussis, uh, pertussis gets the nickname whooping cough for a very good reason. Uh, Chandy, can you talk about the symptoms of pertussis? Yeah, so the early symptoms of pertussis are very similar to a cold. So you have runny nose, you have a mild fever, you can even have nasal congestion. Um, as it progresses, you can have severe violent coughing fits. And you, a lot of times pneumonia is a co-infection that happens a, a, together with it. And that's, you know, it's got its name from the violent coughing fits that it produces. And in between coughing fits, especially in children, they take deep breaths or gasps that make a, like a whoop sound. Um, so that's kind of where the, they got the name. Yeah. And... It, it, this can be a very serious pathology for some. Um, how dangerous can this get and who's most affected by the most serious pathology? Yeah, so the Bordetella pertussis bacteria can infect anybody. So it can infect adults, infants, anyone, but the most vulnerable are infants one year and under because they haven't built their immunity yet and they haven't finished their vaccination doses yet. So those are the biggest danger areas. Um, the bacteria is extremely wily, ex extremely resilient, and in some cases has even broken through the barrier of vaccinated individuals. So it enters our airways and gets, you know, it makes its home right here and then uh, releases a bunch of toxins. So in addition to it colonizing the rest of our and growing and colonizing our respiratory pathways, it releases a toxin that damages our lining and that produces that characteristic cough. 
Another toxin that it releases it blocks our first responders. Our immune system have these first responders called neutrophils. So they show up like immediately when they sense an infection and they're supposed to eat and destroy bacteria or virus or whatever's causing the infection. But these, you know, Bordetella like releases a toxin that blocks them from even entering the site, which means it has more time to grow and colonize more of our pathways and our lungs. So it, it can be quite dangerous. Yeah. And, and as you mentioned early on, this is a bacterial infection. Um, so what, how about the diagnosis, laboratory diagnosis? Is, is it still traditional culture or is there more modern molecular tests involved? Oh, it's, I think the culture is still the standard of standard of choice and you mm -hmm. can do a blood test, but they'll do a physical exam and you'll get a mucus sample taken and they'll do a tissue culture. That's the, the toxic, the toxins that Bordetella releases actually neutralize a lot of the standard media cultures that are used in labs. So they actually need specialized uh, solutions to make, to grow the bacteria in the lab and then study it. So you'll need some specialized equipment for that. Yeah. Um, so if, it, if it's bacteria, it, it can be treated with antibiotics, right? Exactly. So there are prescribed azithromycin and there are a few other antibiotics that are prescribed. And if, if you think you have, if someone thinks they have whooping cough, you know, please talk to your healthcare provider. They'll find you the right one. The key is to get detected early. So if treated early, the good news is that the antibiotics are extremely effective. But if you wait till after three weeks of infection, a lot of damage is already done. So it yeah. to your cell linings and your lungs, so it can be hard to uh, treat. Yeah. So as I talked about in the intro, that there has been a rise um, starting around the late 1990s of pertussis, and some of that ha that has some of that at least has to do with the the vaccine, the way things have changed with the vaccine. Chandy, can you discuss the history of the pertussis vaccine? Um, it's, it's been very effective. However, it changed uh, for several different reasons, and that may be linked to the return of pertussis in the past couple decades. Uh, Chandy, what's the story behind the vaccines, the history? Yeah, it's it's really a fascinating history. So, I mean, we don't have time to go into all of it. I hope people <laughs> who are listening, you know, go down a little rabbit hole, YouTube rabbit hole for this. But in the 1940s, uh, three women, 1930s to 1940s, three women, uh, Paul Kendrick, Grace Eldring, and Lonnie Gordon worked on developing a vaccine for pertussis. They, in the 1940s, they were successful and they combined it with diphtheria and tetanus and released a DTP vaccine. So as the vaccine began to roll out, and as we discussed earlier, it was extremely successful. Cases really dropped in the 70s and 80s. Um, but in the early 90s, as cases dropped, then people started talking, you know, people weren't dying of whooping cough, and people started talking about the side effects of the vaccination. So some in, they were rare, but you could get fevers, and you could get, um, some. in rare cases, you could get convulsions, and there were a few other side effects. But there was a huge public outcry, and the, in the 90s, uh, researchers from Japan identified a different kind of vaccine that then took over in some countries, like the United States, the UK, Sweden, Japan. They switched over to this. So the difference between the original one, the original one is called a whole cell vaccine. So that they use the entire bacteria, but a dead version of the bacteria to boost our immune system. So it doesn't cause the disease, it just cause, raise, boosts our immunity. Mm -hmm. But in the 90s, they then created a slightly more dilute version with maybe parts of the bacteria, not the full full part of it. So in a sense, it's, it was a little less effective than the previous vaccine. So the, one of the reasons why people think that our immunity is waning right now and cases are going up is because of the switch to some of these, uh, to the acellular version of the vaccine. Mm. I mean, just to be clear, both are effective. The original one was 90% effective at preventing cases. The acellular one was 80% effective at preventing cases. It's just that your immunity wanes over time. Chandy, are there any calls for returning to the whole cell or, or, or they just don't want to, you know, the mess with the risk and the small risk? Yeah, I think like most, you know, drug manufacturers in the 90s got hit with a lot of lawsuits sure. over this and it was a huge outcry. And, you know, this was before 
the internet and social media, you know, we say a lot of that right now, but this was even before that. And so I highly doubt that we would move to that. Yeah. However, researchers are looking to see if there's something better we can come up with that can uh, be more effective than both of them. Right. And just want to let, you know, uh, point out something to the audience that the vaccines are the most effective way to prevent whooping cough. So we're not saying don't get vaccinated or get your children vaccinated. Uh, just want to make that very clear. Um, Chandy, any final thoughts on pertussis, the vaccine or any related topic? Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, I really wanted to stress that the most vulnerable of all of them are infants under one. And so the CDC actually says that if you're pregnant, uh, they do recommend a vaccination. So I would talk to your doctor about your options if you're interested. And the second thing is that adults may dismiss symptoms of pertussis because early symptoms just look like the cold. So before you get a cough, the violent cough, you assume you have a cold, which is great. But if you plan to be around babies, or little kids, you stand the risk of maybe giving them the infection. So you could talk to your doctor about your immunity. Yeah, very good. And uh, I'll go ahead and link to Gideon Informatics uh, in the show notes when I publish the podcast. So you can check out more of Shandy's writings. They're, they're really uh, interesting and informative. And I want to thank you again, Chandana Bala, for sharing your uh, time and your expertise. I really appreciate it, ma'am. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you so much for having me.